Hello, in this video let's learn about Production Possibilities Frontier which is a production model uh, and also a model that shows opportunity cost of making choices. So here we go. So when economists mention productivity and it's probably a topic we're obsessed with, what we're really talking about is uh, the output for each level of input. Remember those inputs are land, labor, and capital. Okay, So any resource that we put into a process uh, we should be getting some kind of output. Okay, So that's what we're going to measure there. And we measure this at the margin. So we might say um, an additional worker at a production facility or a service facility, um, more natural resources, and we, we're going to measure how many uh, that is. Okay, For college students, it could be number of hours studying. So if I study for another hour, what kind of increase should I see in my ability to understand or my test scores? Okay. If you work an extra hour or you work slightly harder for a particular time an hour, how much output should you get? So that's what we're trying to measure here. Um, here's a problem uh, to work through that we, can, that we can do here that illustrates a lot of this stuff. So we've got two people on a desert island and we've got Gilligan and Gilligan can do these combinations here and the skipper can do these combinations here. So for example, if the skipper chooses this production point, they're choosing not to fish but to go catch 40 rabbits and then all the combinations in between and if they just catch fish they can do 20 fish and zero rabbits. Gilligan has these combinations too so anything that he chooses is his choice and then he's giving up something else when he does it. So what we do is we usually graph these so that they're easier to see so uh, let's go ahead and do that and this graph is called production possibility frontier so um, we'll put one uh, thing on one axis so we'll put fish up here, when I say thing, I mean thing that we're producing. Whoops. Okay, and then down here we'll do rabbits. Okay, so uh, let's do this first point here for Gilligan. So we're going to graph each of their production possibility frontier. It shows us what's possible to produce. So when Gilligan doesn't catch any fish, so he's zero on the fish axis, he can catch 20 rabbits. So that's 10, 20, so he's right here. Okay, so that's 20 right there. So that's this point right there. Next, if he chooses to spend some of his time doing rabbits, he can do, uh, or rather catching fish, he can catch 10 fish and 15 rabbits. So 15 on the rabbits axis is going to be right here, and then 10 fish is going to be right here. The next one is 20 fish, so 20 on the fish axis and 10 on the rabbit axis. And then 30 fish and 5 rabbits, so you can catch that right there. And then finally, uh, 40 fish and no rabbits. So we'll connect the dots there. So for Gilligan, this is what's possible to produce. He can produce any of these dots that I did because that they're each a point over here. He could also catch something here, okay, so he could produce at those levels. And those levels are him using his resources, his land, labor, and capital efficiently, okay? Now if he's somewhere, say like right here, he's only catching 10 fish and 5 rabbits, that's inefficient. So that, that point, be, and the reason it's inefficient because he could be up here, he could be right here. He could be anywhere along that line there. Okay, let's see what the skipper can do. And I think I can do a different color. I can. Ooh. Okay, so we'll do the skipper in blue. Okay, so I don't do this one a little faster because we do that first one uh, a little slow. So zero fish and forty rabbits. So he's uh, zero fish, and this time he's thirty, and then forty. So he's all the way out here. His next one is five fish and thirty rabbits, and then he's ten or he's twenty rabbits, ten fish, and fifteen fish, ten rabbits, and then twenty fish, zero rabbits. So here's the skippers. That should be a little straighter. 
This is what's possible for him to produce. So any any uh, point along this blue line is possible for the skipper. Okay. Now clearly we can see who's better at which thing. So if they kind of went at it alone, then they probably produce somewhere in the middle. But if they make this decision, which is pretty clear here, that uh, Gilligan should go catch the fish, because if he just catches fish, he can do 40 fish. And the skipper, if he just catches, if I can do this in green, if the skipper just catches rabbits, he can be out here, they'll get 40 of each. And that combination can't be matched by any other combination. So if they specialize in trade, they'll be both better off. Okay. Um, just because they have different skills and different talents, we call that human capital. Now out here, this point here, uh, 30 rabbits and 20 fish individually is not possible for a, either of these uh, folks. But it is possible if, say, Gilligan got some kind of capital that could um, help him to produce, catch more fish, you know, a net or a better boat or something like that, a better um, lures or something. And then uh, the skipper, if he gets a better rabbit trap, he can probably catch out here. So the beauty of specializing is that they probably will figure that out. Okay, They'll get more productive as they produce more. So that's that model uh, there. Okay, So a lot of times we just look at these uh, in the book and we see um, product A and product B on this example. And A, B, C, uh, those are all efficient. Uh, this point here, we'll call it point F. This point down here, we'll call it point G. Those are both efficient. Okay, so any any of those points are efficient. Point X inefficient because we're inside of the production possibility frontier, and then point Y is not possible until we produce, until we get more land, labor, and capital. Okay, and we actually have data on this. So what economists do is we look at the the total level of output, and then we hold the prices constant, and then we look at over time. Okay. So in terms of factors of production, we're using those factors of production uh, way better than we used to be. Okay. So in 1980, this was the, the output of each um, factor. We've more than um, we've got that by a magnitude of uh, 0.75. Right. Um, you know, up, up over 200 uh, percent. Right. Then we saw a dip. Okay, so this is 2007 to 2009, so we, we got less productive during the housing crisis, but since then uh, there's been increases in, in productivity. And the reason for this is that the capital goods are more efficient than human goods, or human production rather, and um, even though we're seeing a decrease in employment in manufacturing, there's been an increase in output. So we're producing more with less people, but the capital goods are getting more efficient, so that's the reason in there. Uh, just generically for any economy, not the United States, some causes that so anytime this production possibility frontier is shifting out, uh, the, the society has gotten more productive, they're able to produce more. The number one thing is the technology level. So that doesn't refer to digital products, it just refers to um, doing things in a more uh, productive way with the capital, right? So, you know, lots of things are technology, we just speak generically there. Other, other uh, factors, human capital, so as society gets more skilled, more educated, they can produce more. Cheaper inputs, so if the price of uh, anything is, is becoming cheaper uh, that we're using to produce, so uh, wages or labor or anything like that, um, oil, electricity, things like that. As the societies get more healthy, now, the United States is already pretty healthy, but you see this a lot in, in countries that are poor as they get richer. People living longer, um, becoming cheaper to produce uh, uh, when and trade. Okay, So transaction costs or anything get in the way of us trading. So that's that. And then uh, finally globalization. So firms being able to produce wherever it's cheapest uh, and then finding new ways to produce those goods all over the world okay this is if we go from this is output of dvd and this is output of mp3 players if we uh if we look at this one we haven't changed the productivity level of the dvd players because that both curves are the same there but we did increase the output of mp3 players so this would be an example where only one one output has been changed by something over here okay so that's possible too 
okay, where the other product doesn't change. Okay, so here's some examples you can um, you can work through if you want. You can go from what is the opportunity cost of going from C to D. In other words, what are we giving up if we move from C to D? Okay, and the answer there is four units of grain because it's what we're giving up there. I, I see that we gain something, but remember, opportunity cost means what we give up. Okay, now if you're going from D to C then we went from 14 units of wine to 12 so from D to C the opportunity cost was two units of wine okay so uh, that's how to read those okay and then finally why does it have this kind of shape because if you look back at this Gilligan example go back there whoop, uh, these are straight lines these are linear straight lines right so why why is that okay so I know we, we don't draw them that way often okay so the the reason has to do with what are the inputs. Okay, so your free time in college, if you were to, uh, if you were to draw a graph of that, how you spend your time. Let me, um, oh, let me draw a straight line. Sorry, no, let me just straighten it out there. Okay, so if you spend your time having fun, college is is really fun, and if you spend your time studying or doing, uh, you know, schoolwork type stuff. Uh, then we'll be over there, right? So let's say you're awake, uh, I don't know, 16 hours a day. Is it possible to spend all your time having fun? Sure. Is it possible to spend all your time studying? Yes. Okay. So that one is going to be an example of a straight line. Whoops. I, I tried to use the eraser as I was talking. It didn't, uh, didn't work out there. There we go. I can get it now. Um, so what we've got here there we go, it's straighter, um, make the dots bigger. It is possible to spend eight hours having fun, spend eight hours studying, so there's a point there. It is possible to spend 12 hours having fun, and that would mean four hours studying, okay? It is possible to spend 12 hours studying, and that would mean four hours having fun. So because your time, it can be spent doing one thing or the other, the input is exactly the same, and the output uh, is just going to have this linear production possibility frontier. Okay. Same thing could be said if we were producing blue cars or red cars. Okay. Blue cars and red cars are exactly the same. They just have different colors, so they're not exactly the same. But if I was producing blue cars or red cars, then the production possibility frontier is going to be a straight line because the inputs are exactly the same. Okay. The but that's not what I'm trying to show here, right? So let's try to show something slightly different. Okay, so let's think about a rancher. Okay, so a rancher has two things that they could do. They could uh, put cows on their land, okay, and uh, produce beef, or they maybe they could produce corn or some other agricultural product. So they've got this farm here, and let's say they produce everything. Everything is beef, okay, and all of this land is cow land, okay. If they took a little chunk here and changed it to corn, the corn production is going to go way up, but the marginal change for beef is just going to go down a little bit because we'll just push the cows out of that corn area. We're not going to lose that many cows, right? Okay, that, hopefully that makes sense. Then as we produce more corn, if we produce a bunch more corn there, we're going to start to see bigger drops in beef and not that much bigger. I mean, we'll see slightly bigger uh, changes in corn, okay? Let's say I give all of this area, take it away from the cows and give it to corn, okay? So I'm gonna increase my corn production by a bunch, but now the cows are gonna start to be bumping into each other, okay? If I give this to corn, I'm gonna lose an increasing number of cows, and I'm not gonna gain, I'm gonna gain some corn, but it's not gonna be these, these bigger gains that, that I had before, okay? And then eventually, as I produce everything in corn, I've just given up a whole bunch of cows. So what that looks like is this. Okay, so this is beef, and this is corn. Okay, sorry, the pen is doing some things here. If I'm only producing beef, that was our first example. Okay, and as I give some of the beef land to corn, I get this big jump in corn, but only a slight drop in the amount of beef. Okay, if I'm all the way down here, I've got this big amount of corn, which is amount right here, but if I give this area to beef, cattle production, I'm not going to lose that much corn. So I don't lose that much this direction. This is a zero. 
but I lose, or I gain rather, a whole bunch of beef. Okay, so that's why that is going to go like that. Okay, now these trade offs in the middle kind of look like that because the inputs are different. It takes different resources to um, produce cows or beef, okay, to raise, the, to raise that product, than it does to corn, right? The corn is a, is a plant, beef is an animal takes different things. So that's why you'll see this bowed action here. It's often called the law of increasing opportunity cost, but it's because the resources used to produce or the factors to produce these two products are bowed. So anytime that the the two products are different that we're trying to produce, we're going to see a bowed out shape rather than this. If they're exactly the same, then it'll be a, a linear line. Okay. Be sure to pay attention to the guns versus butter example. That's on another video, and email me if you have any questions.